Let's not Johnny Alman. Welcome to Damnation Versus. How are you, pal? Hello, I'm good, thank you, mate. How are you doing? I'm good. Happy New Year. First guest of 2022. Yes, Happy New Year. Happy birthday as well for your 40th. Uh, it looked like you had a belter. I did, I did. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for asking. Um, or saying, I should say. The, um, so, Johnny Almond of Triple G. Uh, for anyone listening who's not in Scotland, perhaps don't know about Triple G, they are well, the big dogs of metal music, the metal scene in Glasgow and Scotland. They deal with bands like Fall Out Boy, Deftones, Machine Head, Queens of the Stone Age, Skin Dread. And you came into their stable having already have booked independently, independently bands like Neck, Neck Deep, Ministry, While She Sleeps, Cattle Decapitation, Terror, Converge. Does that sound about right? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, bands like Ministry have, have done the houses a little bit. They've been going so long. I wasn't the first person to do them. But yeah, I'd, I'd worked with them before I joined Triple G and I brought them in and, and did a show of Triple G as well. So yeah, and then Converge again been around a long time since before I was before I was going but yeah it's it's one of those ways when you work with an agent as you'll know you you build up a relationship and their their stable kind of becomes your stable to a to a point. Aye I was always kind of interested I mean I had our mutual friend on Ian Shaw who kind of discussed the whole the promoting side of things and the bookings and the pencil and double pencil and triple pencil Uh, but the reason I'm quite interested in speaking to you right now is here we are it's third week in January 2022 we're losing gigs again, or have lost gigs again in Scotland. We're not even allowed gigs until Monday the 24th. And in England, there's been a lot cancelled also. So I want to get, for somebody that's at the coalface, so to speak, what's it like? What's, what's the situation right now? Well, it's, it's difficult because now we've got the go-ahead. There's nothing to stop us doing a full capacity gig of any size in Scotland as of Monday the 24th of January. Uh, my first gig back is the 25th of January. It was a bit touch and go about whether we would, whether we would do it. And obviously, because of that, I think people's buying confidence has been has been down. Uh, so we're, it's been a bit of a struggle to kind of get people back on side to realise that these are going ahead and there's no restrictions. And because you get a mixture, you get a lot of people that are kind of they're nervous to go back to to big crowds and that's that's totally understandable i'm the same in terms of i'm, I'm trying to be quite cautious and about what i do and try and stay safe uh, but you've also got people that that kind of don't want to spend the money in case stuff gets cancelled and again it's understandable because we've got so many things every day and you'll see i mean i've i've had both sides i've had tours that have cancelled because they're coming from america and they're doing the mainland which they now can't really do i think germany has been pretty badly hit with venues only they'll have 25% capacities. Right. So I think the issue there is when you get, if you get an agent that books a lot of shows in Germany, it's a, it's a hefty chunk of a European tour. So a few bands have decided to pull the plug, but then you get other bands who decide, well, we'll just come and do the UK shows because we can do them and the fees are okay and we know we're going to make money in the, in the back end, as it's called, which I'm sure we'll talk about because I know you've got your opinions on that one. Uh, so they know they're going to make their money so they can come to the UK and do five to seven shows and they're going to know that they're going to be able to make their money back yeah I mean last it's funny you mentioned the whole sort of the reluctance to go to shows because the last time when uh, I was it was it was your show it was a sleep talking show that you put on in Glasgow then got COVID couldn't go to and the yep. two I don't know are they your bosses or the guys who run Triple G, whatever, Big Duncan, so uh, I sat down with them and they were saying, look, we're getting this up, can be 20, 30% of the ticket buyers, but literally people that have tickets don't show up, and that's exactly what we experienced at Damnation 2, there was, I don't know, maybe 20% of people who had tickets for both nights didn't show up, so was that, did you see that across the board? It really did depend on the show, uh, I mean, the first gig I worked back wasn't a Triple G show, I re- to show for a friend who's based in England it was an indie gig it wasn't anything related to what I do but it was a it was at St Luke's which is a 600 cap venue sold out uh it was the weekend of transmit which I think probably hindered it a little bit but it was sold out 600 tickets and you had 250 people turn up which is like a what 65 ish percent drop off yeah which is mental and it was but like I say it was transmit weekend and I think with it being a similar crowd a lot of people were 
kind of apprehensive because they wanted to go to transmit and they didn't want to catch anything and not be able to go to the, the big festival. But, go on, sorry. That's just insane. It's insane to think that 300 people, I mean, everybody's been in the position that I'm going to go to that gig, I'm going to go to that gig and come the week or the night of, ah, fuck it, I'll make some dinner and I'll watch Netflix. But the idea of paying your money, having a ticket, I mean, before the pandemic, and I don't really recall any situations unless there was some sort of family emergency where someone didn't go to a show that they'd already bought a ticket for. Yeah, and I think... The pandemic's definitely hit that. And I mean, generally, I would expect maybe a 10% drop off. But again, I've had, I've had sold out gigs at the garage. We've had maybe 500 turn up into 700, uh, which is what, roughly 200 tickets. You're talking nearly a 30% drop off uh, in that one. If it's been rescheduled, I find that the drop off numbers are higher than if it's a show we've announced and it stayed and, and happened. Uh, and I think a lot of that's down to do people forget about the rescheduled date, have they now gone, I actually can't be asked of that show or can they not make the date and they've not got a refund? There's, there's so many different variables to, to working out why someone wouldn't go. And is, across uh, the shows at Triple G, because I mean, you guys have got everything lined up from Hailstorm to, you've got Sabaton at the Hydro, you've got Machine Head gigs left, right and centre. Are you now seeing across the board that there's just slightly more reluctance to buy tickets regardless of when it is in the year, because so many people have had two years of cancellations, rescheduling, no getting their money back, no quite sure they go. And then also just the, the honest hesitation of going anywhere while COVID stuff thing. Yes and no. I think it does depend on the audience. Uh, I mean, I've got, I've got the Knock Loose Terror Tour coming up and we announced the support bands for that on Wednesday and my ticket sales have shot up since we've gone, this is definitely happening here's the lineup now you can get your tickets and my ticket sales have, have gone through the roof again which is which is great news for me but then i announced the roller tomasi show last week and at first i got a couple of messages like is this definitely going to happen because like it's in february and basically the roller tomasi show is because they can't go to the mainland they wanted to add a couple more uk shows and the reason they didn't come to glasgow in the first place was it was going to clash with the architects tour that got moved to may yeah so we're like we don't want to clash with architects uh so we managed to get a, a show in the rescheduled lineup. And I had people mention that, is this definitely going to happen? Because we're not confident in buying tickets until we know gigs are coming. I'm like, well, I wouldn't have booked it and announced it if I wasn't confident it's going to happen. And as soon as we put it on sale, I don't know if those people are in the minority. But yeah, Roller to Massey tickets flew out instantly. Yeah. It was, it's been a really great start to that show. So I think the older audiences for, I mean like you say we do stuff like Hailstorm which I believe sold out and I, I work with some classic rock bands as well bands like Massive Wagons and bands like Those Damn Crows and I think because that sort of hard hard or classic rock audience is a little bit older there's maybe a bit more apprehension there than maybe your kids that are going to go see Knock Loose or your mid to late 20s and early 30s that want to go and see Willard Massey yeah, so it's a, a weird knock on because that, that's a strange. I mean, somebody sitting in Glasgow was sitting and saying, Fucking hell, how come we never get the role to Massey tour? And then you had the only reason you never get the role to Massey tour is because there's a date the architects were playing, which is no longer happening now. So, no role to Massey who can't go to the mainland are going to come to Glasgow. I mean, that's a, quite a bizarre twist to how that came to be. So, is, are you seeing a lot of that? And also, when we had the Ian on, um, and he was talking about venue availability. He said it was an absolute nightmare in Birmingham because what was happening is all these cancelled or soon to be cancelled tours were all holding the dates. So then yeah. promoters like him in Birmingham couldn't get anywhere. And that was seemed to be what was happening in London and Manchester as well. Was that a similar scene in Glasgow and Scotland? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, mid-2021, I was trying to book shows for the end of 2022. And I'm still talking about stuff for December and November this year that the venues I'm, I'm going to have to take on four of the promoters to potentially get the day they want to do for your venues like the garage and SWG three in the Barrowlands. It's, it's a bit of a minefield but with the Royal Tomasi thing. Yeah. And it's a difficult one because I understand as a, as a punter, that kind of frustration when you see UK tour and it's, it's England and Wales, but what people don't understand is there's so, again, so many variables to that between do the band, not think they have as big a pull in Scotland, so they don't want to do it. Have the promoters turned it down? Because as I've just said there, when we initially started talking about Roller Tomasi, it was the same day as Architects is the day they could make Scotland work. And I wasn't going to risk 
the the finances when I knew that architects in an arena is going to take a massive hit out of pretty much any rock or metal show that's in the, the city on the same night. On top of that, you then if you don't get a deal from the promoter, they're not going to just accept it because they need to play the city. So all these things do take into account how the routing works and whether they can whether they can make it up to Scotland. Yeah, and how about how about the, the venues themselves? Have they all stayed? Because we've got an unbelievable selection of venues for the Cat House, the Stadium, the King Tuts, right all the way through, as you say, Swedge and Badlands and the Callum Academy up to the Hydro. Is have they all been kept in operation? Everybody still above board, heads above water. I believe so. Uh, there's no there's no venue closures that I've seen and, and touch wood. That's that's not going to happen, especially now we can open from Monday and. A lot of what I find, a lot of the venues in Glasgow, apart from your bigger ones like your Barrowlands and your Academy, they use for club nights quite a lot. So they, they make their bread and butter. I mean, look at the garage. It's open every night of the year. They make so much more money off the club than the gigs that if they can't open for the club, that's where they, they really take their hit. So yeah. it was tough for venues like the garage and the cat house during, during the lockdown because they couldn't open for their bread and butter. And then... We could do a couple of gigs, but then they're still not making the money on the bar from that they would do if they could open for the weekend. So it's um, it's tough, but yeah, I think venues had it tough. Venues had it really, really hard, and I think we need to remember that. We need to make sure that we are supporting as many different venues as possible from your grassroots, your places like Audio and Stereo and at Ivory Blacks in in Glasgow specifically, right the way up to the the Hydros and the Academies because it's a whole what's the word it's a it's a system and without the smaller venues the bigger ones don't get the bands that then yeah, go absolutely. on to play their venues no not no, into crystal palace for your paint <laughs> between <bands> exactly <laughs> yeah that's the thing just go and buy a beer or audio you're there see and this is the thing that i try and say a lot of people always and you'll probably get it with damnation how many people ask for set times in advance but i personally won't post the set times at all apart from doors are at this time first bands at this time because for me, I want people to come in and use the facilities of the venue. I also want to see these support bands because you just never know when you're going to see a band that you're like, holy shit, these guys are my new favourite band. Yeah, I mean, we've all missed, we've all missed uh, cracking bands. I mean, I, 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 I sometimes, because there was an idols that had the big thing about that, they weren't going to post any support times. And I've got, yeah. as an older man now, who's an older gentleman, I've got a bit mixed feelings because one, I get that, and I've been to many a show, and I show up and I've seen the support bands, but two, I've also got a life and three kids and a job, and if I bought my ticket to see Idols, and I want to go and see Idols at Barrowlands, I also feel like, well, I'm only asking when you start, because I'm going to get there. Now, I might, the, seeing the support bands might never be an option for me. I might only get away from yeah. work at half past seven as well, so I, I get the whole support, but I think it's one of those idealistic ones sometimes with, with, with bands, I mean, for a band like Idols, well, of course I would say that because it's a win-win. Looks great for you, looks great for sport bands, looks great for the fans. But if I'm sitting there and I've got a ticket and I just really want to know if you start at half eight or nine, because I'm struggling at the minute to get to that show to see you that yeah. I paid the thirty-five pound ticket. Aye, that was a wee bit. Sometimes I'm like, aye, it's easy, it's easy for you to say that when you're the, the headline band paying on the money. You're not going to say, well, if nobody shows up, we're going to give some of the sport bands some extra money. They're not going to say that at all. So just. Uh, Calm it down with some of the with some of that chat. So, aye, the um, what was going to say as well that with with Scotland, this is probably good Wednesday. So Scotland opened up two days ago, and that's the last week in January. But you've got the terror and not close show happening. With what in two and a half weeks, three weeks time? So the tenth of February. How close is that? Because it seems bizarre to me that as, as we're talking right now, you can't go and watch a band play 101 people in audio, but in three weeks, three and a half weeks' time, you're going to have these two American bands coming across and playing a packed place at Swedge. So, I mean, what's the chat been with that? Well, again, because, <clears throat> because we, can, we can open and the restrictions aren't enforcing anything that mean we have to cut the capacity, we're good to go. Uh, I know that Knock Loose and Terror decided to pull the European shows because of the the kind of venue closures, but the bands are doing big enough venues in the UK that they're, they're going to be making decent enough money that they can afford to just do the UK shows. They're going to play to decent crowds. They've been really good on this one, obviously. I think in an ideal world, we all want to go and see Knock Loose and Terror. And I remember you had when you had Tom from, from Paradigm on, and you were talking about the idea of kind of packaging bands up. 
knock loose's agent are really really good at that and you work with marco all the time yeah and he's he's really good at making a package and i think part of me was really confident we're gonna have this massive kind of all american hardcore metalcore package that's going to really like set fire to the venues and because of covid we've maybe not got that but we've got some really strong uk bands on it in in the form of static dress and then we're adding a local to every single show so i know that harriet are playing some of the shows uh i've personally added a band from glasgow called the spies who've just been to the america uh, been over to america and played fya festival yeah i think it's fya i don't know if it's fire whatever it is but they've just done that and they're from glasgow so it's a nice opportunity for them to play to like i say qmu's 900 people so the potential they could play to 900 people and 900 people probably haven't listened to them you, you may be going to have three or four hundred in glasgow that know them because they go to hardcore shows but there's a whole other audience there that knock loose are giving a band from glasgow the chance to play in front of and i think that's a really nice move for them to do but as we sit here right and you've got faith no more said two months ago we're well, not going to do hellfest in france in eight months time you've had phil and selma when the illegals have now cancelled bloodstock and brutal assault and i've never been in august this year so that's how far ahead these american bands think so if they're not loose to be saying fuck's sake in scotland for one of their dates we are three weeks before you weren't allowed to go into a venue at all yet we're going to still i mean that's credit to them for and their agent the manager and everybody else involved because by the time if Nicola Sturgeon had said, you know what, we're going to continue this for our two or three weeks, I mean, the flights, everything's done. I mean, flights, hotel, booking, all that, yeah. everything's done at that stage. So, I mean, was it always a case as soon as the news 24th that we're just going to stick with it? Or was there a plan B that they were going to say, right, okay, we could maybe live and just not do Scotland to just make England work? There was never a specific conversation about Scotland between me and me and Knock Lewis's team. Uh, if it had come down to it and we were getting close and we couldn't open, it would have been a, a further conversation. I mean, if you want to discuss that one, uh, on the 25th, the day after we reopened, I'm working with Dan Tompkins from Tesseract. He's doing a, a solo tour. And we had multiple conversations between me and, me and Liam, the agent who booked the tour, and, and Dan himself. We all, we all had a chat. And at one point, it was very much, well, we don't know until the 18th if we can open. At that point, it's then a week until the show to sell the tickets. It's, we're going to be dicing of whether it's going to pay off for any of us because although for me as the promoter I take the risk on the fee and the guarantee and all the venue hire and all the catering costs it's a risk for the bands to travel from London to Glasgow for what's it's not realistically a massive sum of money and they're paying for hotels he's got to pay for session musicians and tour crew he's probably not making a, a vast amount of money off the show so for him to come to Glasgow it's probably going to lose him money as well so it was very much a well do we pull this or do we see how it goes and we decided to see how it went and we got the go ahead and again since we announced that we can go ahead you are finding that the people are slowly starting going well if it can happen i do want, i want to see what this is like i want because as far as i'm aware dan's never done a solo headline tour it's always been test rack tour when he was in sky harbor so people are curious and they go well i want to see this so it's going to happen because there's no restrictions to stop it and Dan's been on the social media saying we're not cancelling we're definitely coming to Scotland I've been relaying that message and we're seeing people are starting to buy but it's 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 basically like trying to ease people back into it and go it is okay like try to take them by the hand and just show them we yep. can make this happen yeah but you know what I'm going to see if I can get bright and get this put for the Tuesday morning then which would make that tonight Right, so, uh, so see if you're listening okay. and you, uh, you fancy a gig, go jump along and see the, what's his name, Dan? Yeah, Daniel Tompkins uh, from Tesseract with support from the Venom, which is Ross from Haken. Right. Uh, it's his side project as well, so they're both at Classic Grand on the 25th. And give Jonathan a high five when you see him. I feel like. yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'll be on the door, no doubt. Another one that would be cutting it fine is the, the Paradise Lost to them. I mean, and they're like they're not young boys, so I mean they're the kind of band you would expect to make say, you know what, we don't need this drama. We can just we can bump this for February, March, April, May. Is that is that another one? Is that is that one of your shows? And what was the discussion with that? That's not my show personally, so I've not really been privy to to the discussions on that one. Uh, but again, I've, I've not seen anything in the contrary. I, can't, I think the biggest one for me that's been a bit of an um and ah, which hasn't even been COVID related, is I'm doing a, one of these, an evening with Keith Buckley of Every Time I Die, yes. uh, which is kind of the spoken word Q&A thing. And I think, uh, I think 
between Christmas and New Year, we got the confirmation this is definitely happening. Keith is definitely coming to do these shows. And then again, the Every Time I Die tour cancelled because of the financial aspect of COVID ruining that for them. And we were, we were again, we were told Keith is 100% coming to the UK and doing his Q&A tour. And obviously everything we see on the internet this week, and you're a bit like, oh, it's a, it's a bit of a spicy one now to do it. Is that a, a not the hottest ticket in town, though? I mean, there's not everybody in a grand that want to get to see that now. Well, I mean, that's the thing. It's very much, you know what people are like, and everyone likes to kind of, everyone likes to uh, rub a neck and watch the car crash on the motorway as they're driving yeah. past it. And I'm not saying that every time I die, one of my favourite bands ever. Yeah. I absolutely love them. So it's, it's been really sad for me to see how everything's played out publicly. But because people know that Keith's doing this, they have bought tickets because yeah. they are expecting well, him to come. And in the day, as a Q and A, let's know. I mean, I, I get what you mean. It's like um, when you get a sort of controversy, then everyone's even more interested. Then it, it's mm -hmm. um, everybody wants a slice of the action. But as a Q and A, I mean, end of the day. So I mean, if there was ever a forum to go and ask a question about just what was going on, so at the minute, so when when is that due to happen? So that's the 9th of February. That's uh, the day before Not Loose. Oft. So if you, you've got a run with Triple G that's the 9th of February with Keith Buckley, then you've got Tether and Not Loose, and the 11th is Paradise Lost, and then 12th you've got Kneecap at the Badlands. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Mate, that's a busy, it's a busy start back into the uh, post-Scottish lockdown. Mm. Well, I've also I've got a show at the Attic on the 13th as well, so it's a run. And then I think the 14th we have Catatonia, but I'm not sure where that stands. It's not my show. 15th, The Vial is in the listings. But again, uh, those, those two aren't mine, so I, I don't know exactly where they are. But no news is good news, in my opinion. Did I see when I was checking out that earlier that Solstafar aren't on that Catatonia quietly on there, or is that just the way it was built? Uh, I've actually not seen, again, I've been so busy with this Dan Tompkins thing for the last couple of weeks because we've been so up in the air about it and yeah. I've kind of focused on my own things. I've had a few cancellations and reschedules here and there. So Dunk does yeah. his shows and he's busy with that. So who, who have you lost? Which shows did you lose for January, February, even getting there into March, April that are just not happening anymore? Never mind postponed. Well, I lost everything in January bar Dan Tompkins. So I mean, the only show I've kept, Lorna Shaw's now moved to 3rd of March, and we did an upgrade on that one from the Cows to the Classic, which again sold out opening weekend of the upgrade, which is amazing for them. And right, let, let's, just, let's just put a pin here in for, for Lorna Shaw, right? So yeah. I don't know a great deal about that band. And then I noticed they get announced, and I noticed they were on the Bloodstock poster. I thought, well, that's intriguing. It doesn't seem like a, a Bloodstock style band. And I listened to them, I thought they were excellent. But then it's one of those bands that the UK just seem they just seem to set everything on fire as soon as they touched it. London sold yeah. it, fucking Manchester sold it, then Glasgow's getting rescheduled and upgraded everywhere. So what's the what's the deal with a band like that? They're Australian, am I right in thinking they're Australian? No, they're American. American. So yeah. is that one is that one of those bands that they haven't played here yet or or haven't played here in a while, so no one was quite sure how big they were, and then they land and it turns out fucking massive. They've actually, they've done a lot of stuff in the UK. I mean, I've had them on stuff like Never Say Die Tour. They were on the, the Face of Death Tour of Decapitated, I believe, just before the pandemic hit. I think it was one of the last tours that happened in the UK. So, so it was, uh, start then? Why, why have all these promoters got them in these 200 capacity rooms that they sold out in a day and then now selling out 500 capacity rooms? Well, like I say, they've been going so long and, and they've got a, a new vocalist who is the guy you've probably heard on the most recent EP. And I think we can all agree that EP is insane. Some of the stuff he can do as a vocalist is like really took them on the next level. I think, again, I use it a little bit, but I believe that song to the Hellfire went viral on TikTok, which brings him to a whole, a whole new audience that, I mean, I'm 33 now and I use it to look at funny videos of dogs, you know what I mean? But you get these kids that, that hear this guy doing this mad pig squealing with his vocals and they're, they're just like blown away by it. So they then go and check out Lorna Shaw and like, oh, I really like this. So it just helps build that. And that's how, how Gen Z are kind of getting these bands now. Right, okay. And I, I need to be, well, not me personally. I don't need to find a way to TikTok. Fuck, I can't even manage Twitter and Instagram. But <laughs> uh, I, I need somebody to find a way into TikTok. If you're listening to this and you're a, 
you're a TikTok influencer who can uh, help damnation in the way in, then please do. That- well, I actually, I did a, I did a seminar with Godia on TikTok for bands. Right. Uh, and it was, it was really interesting. It was uh, through, through a friend of mine called Stefan Sponson, Baroness, uh, Baroness Music Management. She's fantastic. If there's any bands, sorry to take off a tangent, if there's any kind of up and coming bands who are kind of, they kind of feel like they've hit a wall, they don't know what to do with themselves. Steph's great in terms of she consults bands and kind of gives them ideas on what they can do. She's not a manager, so to speak. She consults you and advises you, well, this is where you should go. And this is what, Steph worked at Live Nation. She was the first woman to ever book a band onto download. Uh, she did loads of really cool stuff. So she's, she knows her stuff. Uh, but she, she hooked me up with this, this TikTok tutorial and it was really interesting to see how the algorithm of TikTok works and how bands can use that to their own, um, to their own game. Right, okay, that's an interesting one. Well, uh, and you're, you're hitting that whole sort of theme, you're a bit of a talent spotter for Triple G. I, I mean, I assume... You, I, I mean, to be. People, people from Glasgow, I mean, you must know Big Dunk because he is Big Dunk, you guys fucking eight foot tall, uh, and you see him at, at all his gigs. And maybe you might know Sue, but he's a he's a pleasant guy with both of them. <laughs> he's a smiley one. <laughs> he's the quiet one. He's he always stays in the back. Uh, but the um, I, I assume when I when I chat to Big Dunk, he's a guy who's been there, seen it, done it all, and doesn't he really strike me as a guy who's going to be sitting in fucking Spotify for hours and then try to find a new band to try and bring up and through Glasgow games, which I assume is why you exist because they need. A guy who's going to sit there and listen to a million albums a week and bring these smaller bands in and do these things. No, I mean, tell me if I'm wrong here. Is Kneecap one of these bands? Because I've seen the you, I, I, I know nothing about Kneecap. And then you post a video and the garage is going absolute bananas. And then somebody's telling me they bought tickets to go and see them in the Barrowland. So are you responsible for that? What's the deal behind that? Yeah, so that's I'll I'll discuss you I'll discuss kneecap first as the main one. We'll go back to the the kind of where I where I sit with things. So kneecap's a funny one. I was kind of sat at home late 2019, early 2020, just before the pandemic, and I saw this video pop up on Facebook from a company called Joe, which is like kind of like lifestyle website. Yeah. And it was stupid questions people ask Irish people with kneecap. And it's basically kneecap asking like why do you hate the English? And they're answering that question. Yeah. And I thought, A, the young guys know really funny. And B, they're quite, they're quite clued up and they're not, I mean, you live in Glasgow and you know what it can be like with some of the sectarianism. They're not yeah. just saying, they're not saying things to be kind of hostile. They have an educated opinion on Northern Ireland and Republic of Ireland and how things should be in their opinion. And they can talk about it quite eloquently. Uh, but they are kind of, they're wee bands. And that's kind of the, the ch- charm of it. So I watched that video, I was like, oh, these guys are quite funny. Checked out YouTube, and it's, it's Irish hip hop, and it was really cool. And then later that night, I see what turned out to be their booking agent posting a video of them supporting Dropkick Murphys at Ali Palace. Maybe. So I was like, I, met, I, I replied to the video like, I've literally just found out about these guys, and this is, this is brilliant, I'm really into it. Didn't know he was the agent, but I knew he was the agent for Dropkick Murphys. And I just said, oh, these guys are brilliant. It's good you got them on a show to 10,000 people in London. Cut to Monday morning, I've got an email in my inbox saying, do you want to do a, a Glasgow show? I was like, yeah, I want to do a Glasgow show. Obviously, again, with being in Glasgow, there's, there's a 50-50 split of people who, who like that sort of thing and people who don't in terms of Celtic and Rangers. So... I knew it could be a bit controversial, uh, but I really liked it. And I saw that there was real promise in it and did my digging and found out that they booked themselves their own UK tour before uh, the pandemic had happened and they played the garage attic. So we booked them in G2, which in the garage is like the 300 cap room. Uh, Got it all ready to go. It took a while to get it sorted because obviously when lockdowns hit, people kind of shut up shop for a while and we didn't really get going. But when we announced it, I think we announced it for, I think it was meant to be April 2021. We announced it, sold out G2 in two hours. And I couldn't believe it. I was like, I knew this was going to be good, but didn't think it would be this good. So we upgraded it to the main hall garage. And then we sold out the garage six months in advance of the reschedule, which was September. 
and then we kind of had this chat a few months before the garage show and said well if they did if they did 700 tickets six months why don't we why don't we give the barriers a try and see what we can do yeah and yeah they've got about three weeks until their barrage show it's it's going great guns and yeah it's it's a really interesting one and they're lovely guys they're it's not it isn't an act though they are really bands it's it's hilarious but they're really good guys and, and in terms of that i mean as sad as it is i mean like the sectarianism in glasgow was the most powerful fucking force i mean it, it drives 90 percent of life up here is yeah. it one of these ones that there is so many celtic fans going to this because these guys are involved or are being spoken about in celtic forums and celtic fans are, or do they go to Carlisle or Manchester I mean, and still get as big a crowd? I think the Irish contingent of Glasgow definitely helps them. Um, I don't know the figures for the rest of the UK, but I know that kind of the cities where there's an Irish contingent did really well. Uh, and But that's why we can do the barrel lines. I don't think they're going to do 1,900 tickets anywhere else right now no. in, in England. But um, I definitely think having, having Celtic up here helps and having people with similar ideologies about being uh, being pro united ireland i yeah. think that definitely helps their crowd and i think the fact that they are younger guys and they've got a bit of a bammy outset i think it appeals to a lot of a lot of the kind of younger kids yeah. and i mean i was really surprised at the show because do they know when they come across here? That, I mean, are they guys that are just about do they know about the football element when they come here that listen don't be walking down the street with your your bar clav one because there's every chance you might get stabbed. I mean, do they know that? Or is it just, is it dress romantics? Or is, I mean, they are, are they aware of, I mean, I'm, they're Irish. I mean, I know I'm not saying they're they yeah. aware of the trouble, but are they aware when they come to Glasgow that not everybody's going to see that as a joke? Oh, absolutely. I think they are. But like I say, touch wood to this point, I've done a show at the, the garage, sold out. I'm doing the show at the Barrowlands in a month's time. There's been no ill will towards the band or the show, which is, which is nice. And, I think it's nice that people can also see that although it's got a serious message behind it, then they're, they're kind of, there's no aggression to it. And it, it's very tongue in cheek, the way they put things across. I mean, they've got a song about going on a night out with the DUP. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's like, it's very tongue in cheek. And I think yeah. people can understand that. They go, if you don't believe in the message, and I'm, I'll, I'll say it because me and you are both thinking the same thing. If you're a Rangers fan, you're probably not going to like it. You're probably going, who are these silly wee dicks? Yeah. But they know, there's no, they know there's no ill will there. It's not like the wolf tones. No. Where they can look at that and be a bit more, there's a bit more of a, a hearty feeling well, behind it. Well, there's a, bit more, a bit, there's a bit more sinister. Well, let's just call it what it is. Something it's just a bit more sinister. And it's only really sitting there as a Celtic fan and saying it's all one with traffic, but it's not. You know what I mean? There's a lot of, there's mm -hmm. a lot of Celtic fans that have yeah, they'll get big issues with that stuff as well. Um, mm -hmm. But I mean, I so you get Charlie and the boys, or you've got uh, the Wolf Tones. I mean, if they go to Manchester or Birmingham or whatever, they're probably not selling out two thousand tickets. And the case quickly yeah. is imagining it in Glasgow, which was kind of the point I was getting at when it comes to kneecap seeing this wee band that you've seen in a YouTube video. Next minute, you know, you've got them playing the same venues, Meshuga and Opeth. I mean, it's like yeah, it, that's it's some jump for for oh, a, massive, yeah. you guys doing some sort of Irish hip hop. So I that's. It's incredible. I'm actually, I need to get along to that gig because the, the garage looked bouncing. <laughs> it looked absolutely incredible. Yeah, the garage was definitely my favourite gig of, of 2021. There wasn't a lot of them, obviously. We only had three, four months of gigs. But uh, yeah, the, the garage kneecap show was my favourite gig of the year last year. And like I say, it was a really nice buzz, really good vibe, despite, again, what people could think of it. There was no animosity. There was no thing. Like I say, 700 tickets. We had two people knocked back from the venue, which is insane. It's such a low number. And like I said, there was no, no malice. There was nothing there. It was just people were there to enjoy the music. Right. Well, I think, I think my mutual, our, our mutual friend Andy kagan has got a, a ticket for kneecap, so he can maybe take he, my, he, he can be my protection in case any Rangers fans try to beat us up. <laughs> well, there you go. Yeah. You've got... I was looking through the gigs, obviously. You've got there's a, there's a strange pupil slicer clash that I wanted to talk about with you. So you, okay. you've you put on uh, Road to Massey in Glasgow, and you've also put on Godflesh in Glasgow. Now, you organised a Godflesh show with support from Pupil Slicer, and Pupil Slicer said they weren't doing the Road to Massey in Glasgow because they were pre-booked for Glasgow. Now, you can understand that if it's rival promoters, because that happens all the time. 
don't you're no that band's not playing the same city as I've paid the money to put them in. But you're the you're the same promoter. So that yeah. was a wee bit an odd one. You're you're not harming one show, but you're you're taking something away from one show to keep the shine on the other show. So what was the thinking there? Well, I actually I didn't actually get a say in that one. Uh Pupil Slice were booked to do God Flesh uh, in April, and I'm happy they're on the bill. I think Pupil Slice were great. Uh, and then it came to the Road to Massey show, and so the way it works from my side, and it's a little bit different from what you do to an extent, I'll get asked to do an offer on a show, and it'll be a case of we need £200 support budget, for example, and we need this much for national advertising, which someone like Live Nation will run posters and in magazines like Kerrang or they'll do online press that I'll pay towards. Yeah. So I get told a budget. I don't necessarily always get told who we're going to be supporting. So when it came to announcing Royal Tomasi, I got all the artwork and the confirmation. It was so the supports are Pupil Slicer and Harriet for the tour. However, Pupil Slicer can't do Sheffield or Glasgow, which tells me it's maybe not to do with the God Flesh show. I could be totally wrong on that one. Um, but they're not doing Sheffield or Glasgow, which are the, they're right next to each other. It's the Friday night and the Saturday night. But weirdly, uh, they are doing other shows in Sheffield and Glasgow. You know what I mean? It was only two places. Yeah. They're, doing, they're doing a record thing where you had the Mothers and Death Goals on Sheffield the night before, and then they're doing Glasgow. So right. I, could to- I could totally understand the Sheffield one, because it's not very fair for the Sheffield promoter mm-hmm. to go and take a punt and people slice and put them on and then suddenly they're on with a Robo Tomasi support. So I wonder if somebody then just took that decision for you in the sense of not even understanding that you were the promoter for both shows. Potentially. I mean, like I say, I was never kind of, when I say I was never consulted, it's not necessarily something that I'm, I'm kind of bent out of shape over. No. Uh, I think for me, Robo Tomasi are the big selling point on that show. Yeah. And whoever's supporting them is, is a bonus. And I mean, Harriet, great band. Pupil Slice, a great band. Given the option, I think they could have done Roller Tomasi because I don't necessarily know how many of their fans are going to pay the same ticket price that Godflesh is to see them. Yeah. I think they're going to play to a brand new audience at Godflesh. I think Pupil Slice, they would have uh, had more people come to see them at Roller Tomasi. But again, it wasn't my call to make. But you said this is going on Tuesday, right? That is new. Roughly, yeah. So it'll already be announced, so I can talk about it. It's worked in my benefit because God Eater are going to do the Sheffield and Glasgow shows of the Royal oh, Tomasi <laughs> Sneaky. I was just about to say, well, this could be the so there you, go. you get pupil slicer back in that bill, but there you go, you've already fucking <laughs> sniped yeah. that slot for God Eater. <laughs> yeah, as soon as, as soon as it kind of happened, my, my, my cog started to uh, send James from Royal Tomasi a text like, hi, mate, are you looking for an opener? Because I'd like to put God Eater forward and... Yeah, they were instantly keen on it, so it's it's a nice one because I think the guys in Goddard will love Roller Tomasi. Uh, kind of like a, a kind of bucket list band to support. So to get them some tour shows rather than are oh, they the local support for the show, to get them a, a guarantee and to get them on the bill and get them advertisers, a touring band is always really nice. Yeah, for anyone who doesn't listen to this all the way till we get to the point of God, why this is relevant because... Jonathan here is a uh, God Eater's manager, so <laughs> a wee bit, a wee bit yeah. of those things there. Nah, good, I'm glad, I'm glad, looking forward to, I'll be at that show anyway, I'll be both those shows, so I'm looking forward to seeing God Eater on that one. The God Flesh one's a bit different for you, because, uh, are you right, what we do is different, what Triple G do, what I do is different, you guys like Ian and Cam, and like a tour comes across, not close, or OPEF or whatever, and they say, they. They farm out to the agents that they are the promoters they know, and everybody has a bit of a bidding war and availability war about venues they can get, and it gets mapped out. Uh, which is the opposite of what I do. I try to cherry pick a lineup of people who are or aren't available, and then I put them in a festival lineup. So, Godflesh is an odd one because that's not some UK tour that's happening. That, for the outside looking in, it looks like you've decided to do what I do and just approach a band and say, would you like to do a show? Is that is that right? You're pretty much right. Yeah, that's almost what happened. So uh, God Flesh's agent is the guy I've worked with a few times. He's been a tour manager on shows I've done as well and his roster is great. Uh, and I've, I've been kind of hitting him up for a while. Like, listen, when are we going to do a God Flesh Glasgow show? When are we going to bring him to Scotland? 
and it's never really worked out. And then I think it must have been August around Bloodstock, because I'm sure I spoke to you at, at Bloodstock about the show and said, this is kind of happening. So they, I got the, got the email from, from Fed, their agent, saying, listen, the band want to play, play Glasgow. And it is very much a, a one-off. It's not a tour, so it does come with some extra costs in terms of transport, hotels, making sure they get to the venue from whether they fly or the train and all that sort of stuff. And then, again, you, as you know, a band like Godflesh, there's kind of more moving parts to it that they need provided because they can't travel if they're traveling by bus or train or plane. So it's a bit different from what I would normally do, but it's not something that I've not done previously. I've done similar things before. So it's not a case of trying to move into that. It was just the kind of stars aligned and they wanted to do Glasgow and I'd asked about it for long enough that Fed had obviously got sick of my pitch and just gone, yeah, let's let's actually do it this time. And so when do you say to the do you have free reign within your role at Triple G to say, look, I'm gonna go here and trying to get Emperor or Godflesh or a one off band to fly in and do something at Triple G or is that something you say, look guys, I've got this idea, what do you think? If it's getting into the massive realms, it's something that me and me and Duncan could probably talk about a little bit more. But generally if it's if it's something up to your balance in your academy where I'm quite happy and I'm quite able to just do my own thing and uh, just keep people in the loop of, yeah, I'm working on this. And yeah. then just, again, I've been, a, I've been around the block a few times with the shows and Dunk appreciates that. And I've got a lot, before I even joined Triple G, I had so much respect for Dunk and what he'd done. So it's nice to work with someone that's got more experience than me that I can still bounce ideas off of and still learn from. Yeah. which is, it's really nice to be able to do. So, yeah, I do have free reign. I mean, I wouldn't do a damnation in Glasgow without speaking to Dunk, or I wouldn't do a, something like a slam dunk or a, a download, like a mini version, because it's a, it's a big ask and it's a, lot of, it's a lot of money. So it's the sort of thing where I'd, I'd want to have the conversation and go like, how do you think we would start something like this and like build something like this? And again, I've done all day as in the past I did a couple of all days when I first moved to Glasgow and even as as recently as maybe 2016 I did an all day and oh it's just so much so much of a hard work like I don't know how you do it year in year out I mean I've seen you at, at Damnation for the last five or six years and generally I get a chat with you and I can come backstage and catch up but it's you generally run off your feet all day so it's, it's I know it's, what it's like it's the weirdest it's the weirdest thing because in one hand you get all this control right you get all this all this controlling power that's taken away from you in a turn package there, as you say, you don't even, in some cases, you don't even know who the sport are. You're just told who the sport is. Well, let's discuss the, the, the back end. So no matter how successful your show is, you only ever get 20% of the profit. The band always get 80% of the profit. They kind of show up. Everything's already pre-planned for the set times they do, when they play, how they'll play. Everything is, is there. And I've done, say, let's say I've done 15, 20 of these gigs myself. Now, it's not that they don't take effort, but once you're there, there's no effort because it's kind of everything just copy and paste it next time. Well, damnation's the exact opposite. It's a fucking car crash from 27 different angles. <laughs> it's just somebody flying in for Australia. There's a fucking car coming in for Leeds. There's a band that don't speak English. There's a tour manager who's got the wrong plugs. Everybody's doing... It's first day of tour times 27 across four different stages in a maze with 4,000 fucking fans milling around. So... Yeah. It's uh, I. It's totally. It, it, it's tough, but the the good side is when damnation really works. That I don't just see twenty percent of the profit. I mean, it, it's it's all mine. It's a hundred percent profit. But it's really when it doesn't work, I see a hundred percent of the loss as well. But with you guys, there there is that you can just do eleventh of February, twelfth of February, thirteenth of February, fourteenth. Even with some massive like hydro level shows. And just kind of yeah. show up in the day, make sure it's there. You guys promoted it, but by the time it gets to the day, it's kind of like the job's yours now to make it happen. You guys have just promoted it. Well, yeah. For me, I kind of promote myself and Paul. We're still on the day piecing it together with blue tank and sellotape. You know what I mean? Yeah, and I mean, I still, I still, for the most part, unless I've got, if I've got two shows on one day, I'll have someone else work one of the shows, but I'll still go to the venue and, kind of be there as their kind of their point of call for the day if they need anything and yeah don't get me wrong it's nowhere near damnation where you've got 
all those issues at one time, but we still get the band that don't speak English or yeah. the driver's off his hours and he's parked in a, he's parked in a taxi rank and the taxi driver's all trying to fight him outside the cat house. We get all that. Do you notice know the difference between when you're getting the first day or two to like the 15th day or two? Oh, absolutely. And I mean, my friend, my friend Craig Reynolds uh, has a podcast called The Downbeat and he talks about this with bands all the time about how you get your you get your rhythm and by the, by day by day five it's it's second nature and it's so smooth but yeah getting a tour where your show's day one can be a long day <laughs> which, and i mean which, as i say as as damnation times 27 <laughs> I mean, it's just, yeah. cause even the bands that are on tour it knocks them with a rhythm because now instead of showing up have their two hour, two hour sound check they're dinner at six then getting back on, getting all the production set up. Now they've got 45 minutes on the second stage. And they, so that becomes their own sort of first day or two car crash as well, with the Eagles yeah. involved. <laughs> we have to laugh because a couple of times I've spoken to Dunk as well. He's always seen keen in the idea of a, of a Glasgow festival. He's always seen quite, and he he's always, oh, I can have looked at Glasgow doesn't really have the venues for it to do something like Damnation. I mean, you're kind of, I mean, I don't know any of the venues, really. I can't think of any you can get a decent second or third room without doing one of these North of the Wall events where you're kind of going for classic grand to audio and uh, Ivory Blacks, which in itself is just a different feel. But that, uh, it's, a, it's a wee bit of an eye-opener when you when you do that, but it's a, it's a nicer feeling when you've got Cultural Luna or Electric Wizard just showing up in Glasgow and it's like day 15 in the tour and you almost feel like you're just... I mean, I help them in with some of their stuff, say hello, and then can I just watch the gig? And like, this is fucking great. But the 20% at the other end is a big bugbear for me. And I take it actually something as promoters in the industry you just need to get used to it because that's just the way the, the rival promoters can accept that deal. So you're just going to have to accept that if you want to win the bid. Well, yeah. And it's, I mean, it's been there since before I started doing shows, the kind of idea of, of kind of a, a back end or an overage people use kind of different ways to describe it and uh i'll kind of break it down a little bit for the people that maybe haven't heard that term before so let's say i'm doing a show with a band where their guarantee is 100 pounds just to use round numbers and it's we'll do maybe versus 80 percent like you said which means that they'll either get that 100 pounds or 80 percent of the profit depending which is higher so if a show sells out and we've made all our costs and after the cost, we've got a thousand pounds, that band will get 80% of the thousand pounds rather than the 100 pounds that they were due to get. So they go from getting 100 pounds to 800 pounds as a kind of really easy way of, of giving an example. But it's been there since before I started and it, it'll be, it'll be here long after I'm in the ground. Yes. So it's it's but, kind but, of just part of the industry. But the bugbear with it is is the for me is there's no protection for the promoter and they say that yes, it all it's all stacked in the favour of the show going crazy and it's sold out and, and I mean I accept it. I and I have said this before in the podcast, I accept it when it's formed some machine and red hot chili peppers. You can't get a promoter who just books red hot chili peppers and then gets to walk away with two hundred grand at the other side of it. And else we would all just be promoters doing that. However, in the level that I operate at, the, the figures don't, they can get slightly better, but no one's walking away rich. Mm-hmm. So, when the, so when a couple of owner, an electric wizard or a Watain show does well, the, the rarity in that scene, it would be nice to say, right, okay, you've walked away with a chunk of change. Whereas what happens more often than not is five, six, seven out of your ten shows don't make money and they still get the guarantee and the promoter's the one left holding the fucking bus, isn't it? With the loss yeah. for the promoter, so I think well maybe that that setup's kept a lot of people away from it and made it because <laughs> there's a lot of people because what can, can happen as well with eighty twenty split is you can have a run of decent shows and then one big failure and then you can take a ten grand loss on a show and the band still walked away with the exact same guarantee they were always going to get and the promoter no the band the agent the manager they all say the same thing it's like oh tough titty. I mean, it's like they all got what they were due to get. They all got the same money, and the promoter didn't. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's. I guess the only thing I can really say is it's kind of, it's an occupational hazard. I mean, I, I got told a long time ago by a venue owner when I first moved to Scotland that we're professional gamblers. <laughs> That's what we are as promoters, and 
it's always it's always felt that way and it kind of psych like without getting too deep into psychology here that makes sense to me because there's so many people i've known in i've been in glasgow since 2000 and 2010 now i think so i've been here 11 going on 12 years and you know people from england that i've been friends with that were promoters in leeds and, and manchester and like birmingham and stuff who've who've done really well and then had a really shit period where they've lost loads of money so they've quit and then three months later they're back in because they just love the buzz and it's, it's the same as it's the same as your coupons it's the same as going to the casino you get a buzz from doing a really good gig I, mean, I suppose i suppose that would be true as well again if it's back to when you are the one with the chips you're the one that says right okay if i'm going to go all in black and it comes out in black i get all the money back whereas you guys are you guys are doing all the gambling, but you're only ever going to get 20% of the chips back, you know what I mean? Which is, I suppose, is what I find quite difficult. And, and more so, not because, not because I think that promoters should make more than bands or the, the managers or anyone, just because I've seen what happens when you lose money. And basically, mm -hmm. it's everybody <laughs> shrugs. Everybody else shrugs and says, well, tough, tough shit. And it's like, well, you guys, you were the agent that told me this would definitely sell a thousand tickets, like guaranteed. Probably this band were going to sell out in a week. You were the manager that told me this band was going to sell a thousand tickets. You were the band that were confident enough to say, get us in a fucking venue with a thousand. And he sold 250. And I'm the guy here now that's the mug. I'm the guy here that's lost all the money. And that's, that's the, again, there's no sort of, there's no level playing field when it comes to when the shows don't work. All ever works in everybody's favour when the fucking shows sell well. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's, it's, but again, it kind of, that's the risk is when a show doesn't sell, but it, maybe kind of you've still got that kind of that period before again i'll use the hundred pound but this doesn't sound like a lot of money because we are talking easy figures for people to understand if someone's getting paid a hundred pounds you still got a grace period of a hundred pounds profit that they have to go over so i mean you're talking your show's got to make 150 quid for them to get 120 right. which leaves you a 30 quid profit and when you get shows like that when you like when you've worked your ass off for a sh show and you walk away with like maybe like 60 to 150 quid. Sometimes it can be a bit like I got out of bed and did like a 12 hour day for 60 quid today. And it's never it's like, it's sometimes it can be like that, but if you've had a really good show with a band and again, we're all in this for the, well, me personally, I'm in this for the long haul with the bands I work with. I, I very rarely work with a band as a kind of, well, I know this will do good for one show. Yeah. And I'll book it. For example, I've done things for the likes of Doyle from the Misfits. And I know that's not, I'm not building Doyle. Like Doyle's not a neck deep where I'm doing it from 200 tickets. And I'm going to build it up to do 2000 plus. Yeah. So most of the time I'm working with bands that I'm going to help grow. And it goes from that point where oh, I made 60 quid on that show, but we had a really good show. And I know that the next show we're going to do is going to be in, Let's say that show is in audio. The next show is going to be in the cat house. They're probably going to set up the cat house and we'll go to the garage. After the garage, we go to Swedge or the Barrows or the Academy. And that's when the bigger money starts coming in on those percentages. Uh, do you know what? It, that lesson was given to me by Duncan Sue in the cat house. I was, uh, I went up to, I was chatting to him about something else. Uh, I think it was Karma to Bum were playing. And I was in the okay. cat house, which isn't in, a cheap venue to book. Mm -hmm. And there was 70 people there, and you had Duncan Sue there. So you've got the two guys giving up their day, their wage that day for a show that clearly must have lost money. And I'm like, what's happening here? What's happening here? And it was about like, some it's like the build, the plane, and, and the plane again, the they never used the word plane again. But like, if, you, if you're getting the Fallout Boy and you're getting the Queens of the Stone Age and you're getting that. sometimes you just need to play the game with the agents as well. It's like, you can't just, they're not just going to give you all their choice picks of here have these bands and don't work with any of the other bands as well. So some of the guys are like, okay, will Karma to Burn ever become the Hydro Band or the Academy Band? Probably not, but we're investing them here. And if that doesn't work, we're still keeping a relationship with a good band and also with an agent. That's about like, fuck, that's another thing you don't get for because there's no loyalty really to Damnation. And at the same time, there's no sense of we're not going to do Damnation either. It's just like, is the offer good for that particular date? We'll take it. And we move on. There's no like yeah. they, they don't say right, okay, well we're not gonna do Bloodstock or download or 
tech fest or art tangent because we've done down there. It's just not how it works with them. But there is a bit of loyalty. I've seen situations where Glasgow promoters will try and get a show that maybe Triple G would have done, but they'll stick with Triple G because that's where they've done all their dates. Yeah, totally. I mean, I get it. I'll, I've, I have a big thing for loyalty, and I know that you and you and Tom talked about this when he was on and Tom talked about being loyal to the promoters that he's worked with. And I never try and steal something from another promoter because it's, if someone's built up a kind of a legacy or a kind of relationship, who am I to come in and try and steal that? Because I know I can do, I can offer more money or I can do a show in this venue that maybe they wouldn't choose or something like that. And it, it should be, in my opinion, it should be the same from the opposite side. I wouldn't want anyone to come in. Let's take someone like Neck Deep, who I've done from 200 tickets up to academy level shows. I'd be absolutely fizzing to, to have someone come in and try and steal that, that from me or something, something similar like that. And I get that agents kind of, some agents are just there to make a quick book and stuff like, it's happened before. I've booked the likes of Madball and Sick of It All and Again, these bands aren't kind of growing bands. They've got their level. They're they're playing where they're playing. Yeah. And I've it comes stuff comes at play like when you have to start paying VAT. Yeah. Because you your your turnover is so much higher. Bands like Madball will see that the fee is lower, but they don't take into account that well, I now have to pay twenty percent of all the ticket sales into DWP or HMRC or whatever. So they'll go to a promoter who maybe doesn't have that cost and can offer them more money or go to an in-house at a venue because they can offset it against how much they're going to make on the bar and things like that. I'm kind of, I'm less precious over. What, what, what has hurt you? Because it does, I mean, it happens all the time. So what ones have been a real stinger for you? The bands you had taken off? I you? mean, I was the promoter for Frank Carter and the Rattlesnakes. Uh, and I did, I did Frank's first two shows. The first show was Ivory Blacks when he'd released one single. And then I did Cat House uh, maybe six or eight months later and sold it out. And then I lost him for the next tour. So, so did, you see, did you lose him at Live Nation though? Uh, no, it was another regional promoter in Scotland. I think Live Nation do them across the rest of the UK, but it's, it's a regional promoter up here still. Because that was what that was good. What I was thinking was going to be the thing was, you get that. Like I actually was. I don't. I don't do what you do, but the shows that I brought up. So if I, I was the last guy to put Electric Wizard on in Glasgow, and then I went back a few years later and said, "Do you want to do another gig in Glasgow?" Sold out every bags. Let's go do the garage. Now at the time, I wasn't really thinking any sort of loyalty basis of it. But I was just like, I was the guy to put his on. I'll put his on the garage. And I'm like, well, actually, the next tour is probably going to be Live Nation, like the full. Shebang, like Live Nation are just taking like, Electric Wizard, they're yeah. going to be good. And so if I'm that wee guy in Glasgow that's happened to, then I assume there's a wee guy that's happened to in Newcastle, Birmingham, Manchester, London, that Live Nation have just come in and said, look, you're doing it. I see that often with the posters, that they have eight dates in England, maybe even England and Wales, then Triple G, for whatever reason, still seem to hold on to the Scottish date. So it's like Live Nation in association with Triple G. Or if it goes across to whatever Fergal's company is uh, in, in Ireland. And yeah. like, that's, that, that's pretty, quite impressive. And, and how does that come about? And what's the value of, the, of Live Nation looking at someone like Triple G just have got it down in Glasgow? It's just no worth the effort to go up there and try and promote the same way? Again, there's, there's a number of variables. I mean, there is a part where someone like Cam will look at the show and go, well, They've worked on that forever, so I'm not going to step on those toes. There's a part where the agents had a relationship with myself or Dunk or not even just at Triple G. Let's talk about Mark Audio or PCL or any of those guys. Synergy, 432. If they've built up a relationship, they're going to say, well, they've done the last show or they've done the last two or three shows and they've all been good. They've not given me a reason to move them. So Live Nation, you can do these shows, but... I'm sticking with Johnny because he's always done a good job. And again, it all comes down to that loyalty and making sure from my perspective, from my side, it's very much a make sure you do a good job and make sure on the day there's no issues and the band are happy. And all you can do, that's all you can do is you can promote a show really well and make sure everything's smooth on the day and hope it stays in your favor. Cause 
Live Nation are, are a big company. Let's let's not fuck around on that one. We know that they're we know they're a massive company that are, that have so many shows. So there is a part of that where they've got downloads and they have all these festivals and all these things they can when, offer. When we were young. <laughs> well, oh, I take we'll we'll talk about that one. I take because yeah, I've seen a lot of I've seen it getting a lot of a lot of shit, but I think it's unwarranted. Well, uh, it's, not, it's, not, it's not even that, right? See if you're going to put on the greatest, the absolute greatest pop punk emo throwback festival, and you're going to get all these bands that everybody in the world wants to fly across to every country in the world and pay £250 a ticket without question. Don't do it one day. Don't do it in one day. Listen, I don't know the logistics. I can't, I can't sit here and just say why they've done it, all that How stuff. How does that make sense? The, the amount of stuff I've seen, like, Again, the amount of like, well, this is Firefest. I'm like, fuck off. You've watched a Netflix documentary and you think you know how it all works. <laughs> it's, 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 not it's, not, it's not Firefest, but this is the thing. Is it? If it wasn't Live Nation, you could almost dismiss it. But it's like, these guys have been doing this in the biggest events in the world for how many decades? This is not a yeah. joke. This is not a joke, right? But, but why? But why, why isn't it three days? Why is it not? Like, why? Why have My Chemical Romance play for 50 minutes? And what we need to know, what we need to know at this stage is if the, the timelines have been put up, I don't know if they have been faked or not, but if they have not been faked, how can, how are Bring the Horizon finishing at 9.20 and Paramore are starting at 9.20? Is it a revolving stage? Is it, is fucking, are Bring the Horizon just going to drop into the ground and, and Paramore going to come out? Like, what, what's going on? It's, yeah, that's the only thing I can think is, I know it's stage one, two and three, but is it, Stage one has two stages. Stage two has two stages. I don't, I don't know, but um, I'm interested to see how they work it. I'm very tempted to go over. I mean, you you slag me off quite a lot for for my music taste, but I, I quite like a bit of pop punk and emo, and I'm I'm quite nostalgic because I grew up in the MySpace generation, and I don't I don't ever deny that. So I saw that lineup, and I was like, how much is the flight to Vegas? And, Wait, you, I done the same. Yeah. But actually, let's be honest. When I first saw, I googled when we were young because I thought there were a band that were playing above Paramore. <laughs> okay, cool. I, I thought they were Paramore. Like there was some fucking massive emo band. I didn't realise that was the name of the festival. So I was like, yeah. okay. And then I was like, ah, it's a bit close to Damnation. And then I thought, right, okay, let's say like most people in that lineup, they like everything on it because if you're going to go there, everything's growing. All those bands are worth seeing, right? Okay, we're back to the one day thing. You're only going to see, you're going to miss two thirds of it, no matter what way you slice it. So you might be watching Paramore, but you're missing two bands that you're desperate. It, it just, I just feel like when you're Live Nation, when you've got the pockets to put on that kind of lineup, when you've got the influence and power to put on that kind of lineup, why not just make it more than one day and just milk it even more? Like make more money for all your stalls, all your merch, all your traders. Make more money for everything. That, like, it makes no sense to me why that would be all crammed into one twelve-hour shift. No, and again, I don't, I don't know the logistics or the reasons, the reasons why they've, they've made those choices. I mean, you'll know more than me in terms of I don't really deal with the kind of the traders and the food and the merch companies like you do at Damnation. You've got Isaw and stuff selling merch in the. I mean, even the just, I mean, even just the, the the obvious factor of like. If you get three 12 hour shifts to sell all these bands' merch and all your own merch, it's like, I mean, download could Glastonbury, fucking Red, Red, and, uh, Red and Leeds, they could all just be one day if you wanted to cram everybody into 25 minute sets, 12 hours, six stages all in a circle. But, like, it, but it doesn't make any sense because if you've got that and you've got that infrastructure and you've got that, I mean, Damnation could go three days if I was just a bigger company with bigger backing and you could say, right, okay, but. The thing that stops Damn Nation that that backing isn't there, but Live Nation have got that, they, and they do it. I mean, they're absolutely mm -hmm. experts at doing it. So, I it's that that aside, this isn't me trying to slag off the thing. It's just like when you put something so incredible together and just try to make it one twelve hour shift, it's about like fuck me. I mean, we get people saying that Damnation, which is the other end of that scale, like there's too many of those twenty seven bands at Damnation. There's too many clashes, whereas this is like the fucking the absolute. Mm -hmm. Pinnacle of that. Yeah. I mean, it's, there's going to be some crazy clashes. And I mean, the thing for me is kind of a fairly centered and uh, someone with a bit of common sense. For me, I'm going to go to the bands that I'm like, 
they're probably never going to come to the UK because a lot of these nostalgia bands, they can, they can do this stuff in the US and they can do tours in the US because they make five times the fee they're going to make over here and they don't have to pay for flights and visas and all that stuff. They have to pay for their merch printing to be extra and, all, and backline hire. They can do a US tour, make five times the money. So I would look at that and go, well, I'm never going to see X, Y, and Z in the UK. So I'm going to prioritize that over something like Paris. I can see when Triple G work with them or, do you know what I mean? There's a lot of things aye. like that aye. where I'm like, yeah. Aye. Well, I mean, do you all want... Go on, sorry. I went off on a total tangent now. <laughs> how, did we get, yeah. how, how the fuck did we go when we were young? <laughs> uh, we were talking about kind of the loyalty, I think, of it all. But Aye, yeah. so, like, so, like, so it does happen. It, it's just that it's a nasty... But at the end of the day, it's a fucking business. I mean, people are going to go... And the loyalty is nice if it plays a part. And it is nice. But I've, I've heard many a time, especially with, um, with sort of smaller post-rock promoters, that have brought up bands like, I don't know, and so you watch from afar or maybe she will, and then like PCL take them over when they start to get to that level. And I noticed as well when um, I was going through the, the Triple G gig lessons, Triple G are doing Sabaton at the Hydro. Now Sabaton have been a, a Mark band for audio. I mean, he's, he's done Sabaton through, I don't know, the Garage and the Barrowlands and Anki, maybe even took them in the Cal Academy. So I, I take it, that, that's not your show, so I'm not quizzing you on it, but I take it that's one of the ones where the management or Sabaton themselves have said that we're now at a level that we're not going to go with a small independent promoter. We're just going to, we're going to go with a promoter at this point that's doing Fall Out Boy and fucking Panic at the Disco and Queens of the Stone Age. Again, I'm not privy to that. What, what, I, would, what I would say is Triple G is still kind of an independent company. Dunk's just worked very hard for a long period of time to kind of get to where he is. We're not kind of, we're not like DF where Live Nation part own it or anything like that. Uh, again, not to kind of take away from DF as a company. They do a lot of great shows. Um, but I don't know the kind of, from my own experience, I've had kind of agents come to me with a band and I've said, well, I'm interested, but they've previously been with this promoter. And the agents turn around to me and go, well, I don't want to work with them what do I do in that situation? Am I meant to go, well, I'm not going to take it because, because that person has done it before, even though you don't want to work with them or do I take the show and continue the relationship we've got? It's, Aye. it's a kind of double-edged sword that way. Cause I piss off someone I work with all the time or I, I upset someone in Glasgow that I might see in a cafe the next week. Yeah. Yeah. No, you're right. As I said, there's no right or wrong. I'm just saying that, that that's one of the ones I spotted as well, where you can get a situation where Live Nation are taking something away from you, but you can also get a situation where I'm sure would have happened to me if I continued with Cut On or an electric wizard or Watain or Napalm Death in Scotland. At some point, they're going to be like, well, okay, well, you've got these guys that are doing these shows. If you if you become the band, they're going to go to the Calum Academy. Oh, it's not the Calum Academy anymore. That's a million years ago, isn't it? <laughs> I still call it the Calum Academy as well. <laughs> I'll always be the Calum Academy, whoever sponsors it. So, no, I, I, I totally get that. But that was, uh, that was one that I'd spotted with that. Another one that's interesting with you guys is this Machine Head Tour. So, yes. how did that come about for Machine Head? Uh, for people who don't know, so I'll get in the background that. So, Machine Head are doing this arena tour in England with a um, Monomath. Well, literally, arena's like Cardiff Motor Point now. And in Scotland, they're doing these five dates. Glasgow, you'd expect, but they're also doing Aberdeen, Inverness, Dundee, and Edinburgh. Edinburgh, yeah. So, again, they're, a, they're one of Dunk's bands. Uh, but I believe the issue... I've, I've tried to work with them on the math, and, and we, we know the production they have, and it's big production. And is it worth a hydro, a 16,000 capacity arena in tickets? I'm, I wouldn't necessarily bank my mortgage on it. No, they love it. Uh, but we, t we talked a few years ago about an academy show and then it just, they just wouldn't fit on the stage with the production they want to bring to the shows. Now, again, I believe that that whole tour is a Live Nation tour. So I don't know why Live Nation and DF aren't doing a Glasgow show. I presume the same reasons I've just said. But uh, Dunk has historically been Machine Head's promoter and Rob wanted to do some Scottish shows as far as I'm aware and 
I believe the idea has been pitched multiple times of why don't we do some, some back to basics machine head shows in small venues and do the kind of circuit and do these cities that wouldn't normally get shows. And they just went, yeah, and went for it this time. Now, it, it, it's a bizarre one because a lot of people complain and who don't live in Glasgow, especially if they don't live in Glasgow or Edinburgh, that they don't get gigs. And rightly so, I mean, they don't get gigs. There's a lot of places mm-hmm. where you're going to have to travel to get into a Glasgow or in the rare occasion Edinburgh. But when you look at it now, so Glasgow but sold it a day, Edinburgh sold it a day, Aberdeen sold it a day. So there's the three uh, bigger cities in Scotland. Now, Dundee and Inverness haven't sold it. I'm not going to dig it in because the venues that they're playing are bigger, weirdly, than yeah. the three venues are playing in, in any part. Is it a disappointment as a promoter when you go, like, right, okay, well, we've brought Machine Head to the Inverness and Dundee for the first time in a billion years, and we haven't done a 1,000 tickets for... I wouldn't say it's a disappointment because I think that I think it'll do it. I'm I'm not sat here going, oh, there's no chance we're gonna we're gonna do those tickets now. I definitely think that those tickets will all go. I think when you go to places like Inverness, it's all about what venues have the facilities. I mean, you're only gonna get those facilities in somewhere like the Ironworks that maybe put on your big countries and your your stuff like that. You're not gonna get it in and they don't have they don't have like a garage or a car house they have yep. to my knowledge and i've i've booked very rarely in inverness because my kind of clientele doesn't really doesn't really ask for that then that city as far as i'm as far as i'm aware you've got the tooth and claw which is a small like pub venue and then you've got the ironworks you've got nothing really in between, in between that i'm aware of i'm probably wrong there i will say that uh openly but it's the same, like, in Dundee, you've got church, and then there's, there's nothing really between church and Fat Sam's, as far as I'm aware. So you can't do a 600-cap show. Or then you go up to Caird Hall, which is, I think it's about 1,500 tickets. Right. But when you, own, when you go to council venues like somewhere like Caird Hall, you then have to pay for your PA as well and all that sort of stuff. And again, you still have to do that with some of these, some of these venues as well because they don't have the necessary PA for a rock show. But it's, it's just nice to give these people a chance. I mean, you're always going to get, not every city in Scotland has the pull that Glasgow does. And that's why on a personal level, I do get apprehensive when it's, uh, let's do Glasgow and Edinburgh. Because for a lot of bands, it's not going to sell. Because you're trying to pull people to two cities that are an, an hour apart. Yeah. Now, you know as well as I do, living living so close to it, Glasgow's so spoiled. The people in Glasgow aren't going to go to Edinburgh. They're just not going to do it. No. Not in the droves they would go to the Barrowlands to see someone in, let's use the Picture House or Usher Hall as an example. I know the Picture House isn't there anymore. But it's just not the same level of pull. So you go to something like Edinburgh, the ticket sales are always lower, and then you go to Dundee and Inverness and you struggle from there because their scenes are even smaller than the Edinburgh scene is. Yeah. And it's just, again, it's the nature of the regional, the regional beast is there's less people there. But again, the double-edged sword is when you don't put those shows, you then get people pissed off. They've got to drive four hours from Inverness and pay for hotels or get trains and they can't drive and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. I mean, it's one of those ones where like, it, it's the future's a wee bit in your own hands. If you're sitting in, in, in Vernes or the Dundee and you're a bit like, you know what, I kind of like burn my eyes, but I've not really bothered so much since. And I kind of like through the Ashes Empire, but what the machine head do now? It's like, just worth your while buying a fucking ticket and going because maybe that next band is knocked loose. Maybe that next band is yeah. a, a sabotage. Maybe it's a band that you really like because the only way you're going to get any scene there and a promoter promoting in that city is by making them profit. And it, I, I suppose as well, if you look at it in an English uh, sense, it would be like trying to ask somebody from London to, so that tour cut machine comes and it tours, but it, they don't go to London. Is a Londoner really going to travel to Birmingham? Probably not. Probably not, because yeah. they're so fucking spoiled to say my glass regions are. It's like they expect every tour just to land in their city. I mean, even more so because Glasgow accepts that some of the tours that do the UK don't ever go to Glasgow. But if you come to Scotland, you're definitely doing Glasgow. And I, I yeah. see your point with that, that it's difficult. How many times do you hear the agents say that they would like to do more than Glasgow in Scotland? Not often. Um, 
I'm talking about a couple of things just now where there's maybe not a Glasgow show or there's a Glasgow and somewhere else. But in, in that case, I tend to want to look at a smaller venue because if, you're, if your band's maybe worth, let's say you've got a band worth selling out SWG3, which is 1,300 tickets. But if you want to do a Glasgow and an Edinburgh show, I'm not going to offer SWG3 and an equivalent level venue in Edinburgh because you're splitting your market. Yeah. So I would maybe look at, let's do the garage and let's do La Belle Angel because they're about 14, 13, 1400 tickets. And the, the agents get that? Like, so if you're an agent, you say, well, I expect three grand if I'm going to do Manchester and I expect three grand when I go to uh, Birmingham and I expect three grand if we're going to do Newcastle. So the, the promoter then, or the agent then come to you and say, look, I want three grand for Glasgow and I also want three grand for Edinburgh. It can be the case, yeah. Uh, it, it all depends on the agent. A lot of people, especially agents that are based over here in the UK, rather than maybe America or the mainland, and the ones that kind of get the, the scene a little bit more, they'll understand that they're not going to get the same money in Edinburgh that they would get in Glasgow. Aye, aye. All right, okay. Well, listen, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you, so let's knock some uh, topics out of the water and get me to my next pint, all right? So, yeah. Uh, Firstly, well, sleep. Let's talk about some of your um, the big hits for you then. So I, I I would suggest Sleep Token because they seem to be like a band that are heading to fucking headline download yeah. at some stage. And that show that you put on but couldn't go to was absolutely phenomenal. Any other? We can you can talk about Sleep Token if you want. But is there any other bands you've just like absolutely struck gold with? I mean, I was really lucky to get in with Neck Deep quite early. Um, Neck Deep kind of first started out and their agent at the time hit me up and said, listen, do you want to do a show for this pop punk band I've just taken on? And I took a punt on it and we sold out audio. And I think it didn't sell out massively in advance, a few weeks maybe. And then I was like, listen, we think there's something here. So we want to kind of skip a few levels. We want to go to the garage. And I was like, it's a big jump from 150, 200 tickets right away up to 700. But if you have faith, I'll, I'll give it a bash. And, they saw out the garage really convincingly and then they were like, right, we want to do the academy. And I was like, oh my God, that's, that's, triple, that's triple the figures, Jesus. Uh, but again, it worked out and Neck Deep have done solid tickets and they, they keep growing and that's great. And it's the same with Sleep Token. You can always tell the things that are there. And I mean, you've mentioned Sleep Token. I think Sleep Token are great. And we did St. Luke's in, I think it was January 2020 just before everything shut down and we did St. Luke's and it was great. And then to jump from 600 capacity to 1300 capacity, again, it's a big leap, but sometimes you just, you have faith in Loathe, another great example. Loathe did, Loathe did Classic Grand Lounge, which is the kind of small 200 cap room on the, the first floor in February of 2020. And then in December, 2021, we did the main hall and it was, super close to sold out it's and they nearly quintru is it quintupled or quintrupled their ticket sales like basically did five times what they've done before and i'm like this is insane yeah and that it's was crazy a, to that see. was an amazing show talk about a band that i couldn't quite put my finger on it's like everybody was good i mean deftones are one of my favorite bands and everybody's going about love and deftones and i would hear some of love and i'd be like it's good it's good but i'm not there's nothing really, there's nothing really grabbed me and said, this is the future that everybody's talking about. And then I saw, I saw them live, right? And I said, oh, there's no barrier. I said, but it's not an issue. It's not like not listening. It's not like there's going to be a pit to love because I feel like anything I've ever heard was quite gentle. And it kicked off and it was like fucking Napalm Death, I blame. <laughs> it was like people were losing their shit. There was walls of death. And it was like, this band are unbelievable. I mean, like, I could not believe how impressed I was. They just, Everything live clicked that I, that I wasn't yeah. quite getting. And now when I hear the music on the record, it clicks more now because I've seen it. And that was... Uh, exactly. Yeah. But one of those bands that, I, I again, I think are going to do big things. Agreed. And then kind of aside from... It's really difficult because my kind of roots are in heavier music. I, I very much love kind of death metal and deathcore and hardcore and even punk. Uh, but I've also got a real soft spot for a really good pop chorus which is why I work in quite a lot of kind of pop rock bands like Neck Deep and Trash Boats and bands like Creeper. My favourite one at the moment that I've been working with for a couple of years is a band called The Band Camino. 
Right. Uh, they're based out of America and in the States, they've done quite a lot of, they've supported like Dan and Shay, who are like a country duo. But they're, they're, they're more of kind of like a pop rock thing than, than Dan and Shay are. And I heard a song they did called Daphne Blue. And I fell in love with it. I thought it was a, such a well-written song and so well done. And I couldn't find any details of, of who worked with them. There was no details online. I was like, I, I need this band. Like, I really need to work with them. And then out of the blue, maybe six months later, I got an email from the agent I work with going, we've just took these guys on. Would you be interested in it? I was like, absolutely, I would. Uh, and sometimes I can, sometimes I can just hear a band. And I, can, I just think that's that's going to do it. And we, I'd love all the bands I work with to do it, but some of them, you know, their niche. I know cattle decapitation are never going to. They're never going to do me a, academy. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? But yeah. cattle decap are a great band, and I would work with them seven days of the week if I could, yeah. because I think I love them. But I also love working with the band Camino and Creeper and Neck Deep. Yeah, I mean, in terms of that, so because you, you talk about your sleep tokens and your neck deeps and uh, your creepers that have just absolutely knocked at the park, and this is no like I, I, I sometimes make this point in the podcast just because something's not successful, doesn't sell a lot of tickets, or I won't book it because that doesn't mean it's not incredible. I mean, some of the best yeah. bands in the world don't sell a lot of tickets, so I'm asking this question about what bands haven't done it for you, but at the same time, no slagging those bands off is a, is a band you've really taken a punt on, and it's been like, ah, fuck, we, we can uh, host, the, host the house that. I mean, when you, when you talk about kind of what the industry term is, I think it's a, a baby band, which is a kind of up-and-coming band that's maybe trying to make it. The most recent one I've been working with is a band called Exploring Birdsong, yep. who it's piano-driven. Uh, I believe so, yeah. Um, I booked it for my friend Tony and they'd supported Sleep Token at the St. Luke show so I took a punt on the fact that they'd played St. Luke's with Sleep Token I had, a, I had a decent place to market off the back of that it didn't sell great but when I saw the band I was like holy fuck this band is just incredible and when you work with a band that you just you can see that moment of gold of like they're not they're not there right now but you take the hit on the financials because you're like, I just, I just feel it. A great example of that, are like Conjurer. Yeah. Because Conjurer for years, I had Conjurer supporting Weed Eater and they, they did a few shows and love, love Brady to death. I think he's, he's one of the, my favorite people in, in bands. Uh, and in the early days, like, oh, you're going to book us. And I was like, just don't know if I can, man. I'm not sure if you're there yet. And then, we did that show at the Garage Attic and it sold out really convincing. I'm like, this is the point now. This is like, this is the, where they hit the peak. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, I've got great feeling. I've got great feeling because there's too many in the bands as well because like, there is that, that grouping of bands, the Venom Prisons, the Employee to Serves, the Conjurers, that you're just like, you're not all going to break through. Some of them are just going to be like good but never really do the tickets with it. And somebody mm -hmm. has to get to that next level to be like, it can't just be loathe and sleep token. There has to be something for that heavy element that does get through. And uh, Conjurer seem like, there's, there's just an excitement about Conjurer. There's just, there's, the, the, I mean, the people are just waiting on that next album and it just to go, right, okay, let's go. Yeah, and the worry for me as a promoter, and I, I do see it uh, from time to time, is how much of this excitement is built by the industry to try and make a product work and that's always a worry for me and, and there's there's bands that i work with where that has been the case and it's it turned you look at the show and you're like i'm really excited for this and the public should be because we're all getting it fed down our throats yeah and then you do the show and it it loses its ass and you're kind of like well where are all these people that have said they're the best band in the world and I think the one for me, Jamie Lenman from Ruben uh, summed it up a few years ago in an interview where he was asked when Ruben would get back together. He said, the reason we won't do it, apart from all the kind of issues they have internally that cause them to split up in the first place and all the things that stop them from being a band that I don't know anything about, the internet's a great megaphone and you can get one person will post a tweet like, I love this band. And five people will be like, such a good band. Yeah. But do those people buy a ticket for it? No. No. And that's, that's the issue you have. And I think 
it's the same as anything. I think the media can really build something up. So on the outside, it looks like a really convincing product that's, that's going to do it. And then it's not got the legs to run with it, which is a real shame because it's no kind of, it's not the band's fault. It's, it's they're, so they're doing what they can. It's so true. It is so true. Because we get caught, we're even so much, and I'm not saying this is done by any sort of malice or bot farms or, or people. It's just like, there is, there is a, um, people are keen to be seen to like something that's the cool thing to like. Whereas yeah. sometimes you get bands of people are not so keen to be seen. To like, and it, then the truth of the matter is, look, like a skin dread for Damnation, all the way back in 2006. I mean, way back when we are just getting started and us booking skin dread. And in the same year, having whoever the fuck we had with them, like an Akakok and a Stamp Ground, right? Yeah. You've got everybody's going to be Akakok and Stamp Ground. Don't get me wrong, they were busy, but Skin Dread was packed, but not one yeah. person in the people wanted to be seen who liked Damnation or would attend the Damnation, not to be seen to be Skin Dread fans. But when it comes, mm-hmm. push comes to shove, everybody's there watching Skin Dread. You know what I mean, it's uh, of course, it's, it's like that, and, it, and it's weird as well. I, had a, I saw something there, and I'm a I don't want to bang on about it, but I can't. The worst place on the internet for me is Twitter. I feel like it's just the, the very essence of the most boring people and the most malicious people <laughs> meeting in the middle, talking shit about their day. And there was, I saw a post with somebody and they said something like, for anybody who still uses Facebook, and I was like, I don't know if like her world, she's got people telling her that people don't use Facebook because in the world I live in, like, the fucking everybody still uses Facebook. It's yeah. like everybody I know is still on Facebook, but it's that point as well. It's like that megaphone. You've got somebody there who uses Twitter, maybe doesn't like it, and then they say, oh, I really don't like Mark Zuckerberg's a robot or whatever, and then their 10 pals tell them Mark Zuckerberg is a robot, and we don't use Facebook either. And then it becomes their sort of echo tunnel that, oh, no one uses Facebook. You're like, well, every fucker's using Facebook. I mean, still, whether, whether the ink is dated or no. No, and I think I, I kind of have most platforms of social media for kind of promotion. Uh, I don't use Twitter to kind of promote any of the gigs I do because I haven't really got the audience that it's does that. Hate. It's only for hate. Unless you want people yeah. to slag off the gig you're doing. I mean, no one's going to promote the gig you're doing on Twitter because that's not what Twitter's built for. It's just to tell you how shite you are as a promoter. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exa- but I mean, you get it on Facebook as well. And it's just, face. it's a weird one because I, I went to a, a conference a few years ago and we went to a social media seminar and they were literally saying Twitter is dying. And then six months later, Twitter was huge again. It's, it's such a diff- difficult anomaly of like Twitter's dead. Don't use Twitter for anything. And now for me, Twitter's like such a, a big kind of platform right now. Whereas Facebook is kind of a bit more for kind of your Gen X and your, your millennials. I don't, th- and then even Instagram to a point, I get less traction on Instagram than I would two years ago. Yeah. And I think a lot of the, I think a lot of that is because of stuff like TikTok, because kids have gone from looking at something and going, oh, that's a good picture. So they want, they want to be hooked. So yeah. something like TikTok, where it's like 30 seconds of chaos is what they want. And they get it, they go, ha that's really funny or funny. that's really thought provoking or all, whatever they want, they can get it. If they want a fucking weed dance video, they're not going to get it from me because I've got no rhythm. But yeah, it's TikTok's where they want to be. And I'm seeing Instagram dying because of that as well. Aye, aye. Anyway, anyway, right. Okay. I'm not going to let you go work in your plug in for God Eater. So mm-hmm. talk to me. That's the other side of the fence. We've, we've, we've delved in, we've delved in pretty deep in the hole. You and I are both promoters um, before anything else, really. But you also for whatever reason, decided to take on a band and manage on that band being the Glasgow Death Metal Band, God Eater. So firstly, what get you into that and what's your experience of managing a band so far? Yeah, I mean, I'll use manager loosely because I'm not, I don't have any sort of training in it and the God Eater guys are aware that I'll, I do what I can for them and they're, they're really happy with, with what we get. Uh, uh, before I worked with God Eater, I worked with a band called From Sorry Sorry from Glasgow. Uh, who are a bit more kind of genty metalcore at the time. Um, and again, it was just, I, I met those guys when they were about 15 years old and they were playing like, they were playing as a local band on my gigs. And I could see they had promise and then they sent me this EP that they'd done at the time. Uh, and I just loved the EP. So I said to them, so I was like, listen, I'm not a band manager, but I think I can help you grow. So what do you think? 
And I worked with her for a few years and then it kind of, it fell off and we, we mutually parted ways and there's no bad blood there. It is what it is. We're still friends. I play, I play fives with Stephen, the guitarist, and he's in Bleed From Within now. So I see him at their gigs and it's all good. And I'd never really, I never really thought about getting back into management because the, the experience I've had with From Sorrow was it's quite a stressful thing for not a lot of payoff. And then a few months after I decided I'm done, I'm, not gonna, I'm never going to work with a band on a face-to-face level ever again, I got a message off of Ross from Gaudio just like, hey, we know you worked for From Sorrow, like, what are you up to now? And I'd worked with Gaudio for their, their first ever show was on one of my shows, and I knew, I knew a few of the guys kind of loosely through other projects. I mean, the original drummer Alan was in Cerebral Boar, uh, you know, Will was in stuff like Exile the Traitor and Servant Son of Andy, who's in the band. Josh the Vocalist had been in a few local bands I'd worked with. So I kind of knew all the guys here and there. And then Ross sent me the demos of the, the first album, All Flesh is Grass. And I was just like, fuck, this is just really good. I was like, and these guys, not that they don't have a clue, but they need someone who knows the kind of business side a little bit to kind of just put them in front of people a little bit. Yeah. And that's kind of where I came in. And that's where little things I've been able to come to you and go, all right, mate, I'm working with this band. Would you be able to fit them on the festival? And you listen to it. You like it. So I get them on Damnation. They do some tours with smaller UK bands. They do an album from there. Like my friends who are booking agents, Ian Shaw, who you have on the podcast, is their agent. So Ian hears the album. He goes, listen, I really like this. And this is, that's what's important to me. I've spoken to a few people and I'd sent kind of the demos of the album and be like, yeah, it's good, but I want to hear the finished product. But then I didn't send it to Ian because I didn't really think it was his bag. The album got released and the day of release, he was like, dude, why did you not send me this? This is really good. Like, who's their agent? I said, oh, we're, we're not really, ha- we don't really have one sorted. And then he was like, I want to do this. So that's when Ian came on board. So with the connection of people that I work with and the people I'm friends with, I can get the ball started. But they're now getting themselves into a position where my influence in terms of the people I know has been enough to kind of like get them up a couple of rungs on the ladder. Yeah. But now they're getting recognized for their own right. And um, it's just, it's very rewarding to work with, you're almost like a sixth member of the band. Uh, and I talked to, we've got a group chat that we kind of have general day-to-day shit talking in. Yeah. But I will talk to Ross from the band every day about what we're doing and what we're up to and what we can work on next and what Ian's working on and, and all that sort of stuff. And like I say, for, we did a couple of singles, end of 2020, start of 2021. And we worked with Steph from Baroness Music on kind of a PR side of things, as well as a bit of a... Um, a consultation side on how we can push this in areas that I maybe wasn't too up on. Uh, and the singles went down really well. And one of Steph's big ideas was Twitch hasn't really hit the music crowd yet, but you need to get on it now before it does. Yeah. So we got, we got on Twitch really early at the start of 2021. And I say really early, I mean, in terms of the music, the platform has been massive for a few years now for gamers and stuff. But there was very few musicians using it. Uh, so we got on there and we started off doing like, Ross would go on and he'd play like some Gaudier tracks and then some like guitar stuff for a couple of hours. And we just saw that wasn't really working and we kind of chiseled it away to now. Ross will go on and he'll sit and chat to people for three hours on a Monday night from seven till 10. And he'll play like the new singles that have come out that week and tracks some new albums. And, we get people from all over the world that have never heard God Eater, but they'll scroll through Twitch yeah. and see we're talking about new metal tracks that have just come out. So they want to come and talk to us about, oh, I really like the new Fit for an Autopsy album. I really like the new, uh, is it Weed Dude, Vega Dude? I've had both names said to me in different ways. We, we, I really we, like that. <laughs> yeah. So, and we get people interact. And then one of the good things is now musicians got on it. I'm friends with like the guys in Straight From The Path. So Straight From The Path will do what they call a raid when they, when they finish their stream. 
they will bring all their viewers over to the Gaudia Twitch channel to join our show. Right. And then you can say to all those people, we're Gaudia, we're this band, here's what we sound like and we'll play like one of the new singles and you'll get people that will follow and people will subscribe and pay like five pounds a month to watch your content. And we found that doing the Twitch stream really helped build us up to coming back into a live setting. So when we played Bloodstock in 2021, the tent was packed and it was a Thursday afternoon before it was busy, but I was at the side of the stage, but I spoke to one of our mutual friends, Sam, Sam Law. And he was like, yeah, there was like five or six rows outside the tent trying to watch the Godita show. I'm like, well, this is why we keep, we keep the interaction high because although it's not a kind of, um, it's not a common medium for kind of a band social media, we've managed to meet people from that, fo- that forum who then come to, the, come to see us at Bloodstock. Absolutely. And they tell their friends. Right. And so, is that, so you've got um, Tech Fest lined up as well. Was it for next year? See, me? <coughs> there are banded bounds <coughs> that you see in quite a lot of them. I mean, as I say, I don't like to be one of the guys that because you knew somebody, you get a slot in damnation, but it's true. It's true. It's like there's a lot of good UK death metal bands in there, but God earned their slot in damnation, but it's because I know you. You get it in front of me, which might not have happened if I didn't know you. And you're a bit like, oh, this is good to give these guys a chance. But I see them now bouncing about, and there are a lot of lineups. Well, yeah, like I say, it's, they're not doing Tech Fest this year. They're doing Hammerfest. The Hammerfest. Which is, I think it's Napalm Death, yeah. maybe. Uh, and they've done stuff like Badger Fest, which is your more Bloodstock style audiences. But again, I work with them because I think they're great. And I wouldn't. I wouldn't kind of put them to someone if I didn't think they were there. And again, if you hated it, I wouldn't expect you to give them a slot on Damnation. But you did. You you liked it and you were like, yeah, they can can play the second stage as an opener. And again, they had a a fairly busy show for a band that hadn't done a lot. I mean, Damnation Damnation is the the show to play. I mean, if you're that band, if you're Gaudy or Cryptic Shift or any or Ren or Infernal Sea, I mean, you want to show up to a show and have a packed crowd that are going to check you out because you're playing Damnation. It is that, it is that festival. So I'm glad that, that is, uh, that's helped me. I'm looking forward to seeing... Well, it sounds like I'm going to see them a lot in 2022. If I uh, fucking uh, the, it lose it. There's, there's stuff in play. Uh, there'll, there'll be a new album before the end of the year that's currently getting mixed and mastered. Um, they're doing the relative Massey shows. There's a couple of tours that we're, we've been put forward for. Because obviously the issue you've got at the moment as well, going back to the pandemic, is a lot of bands can't do Europe. So they're now wanting to extend their UK run, but they're then losing support bands who can't get here from Europe or, sorry, from America or Australia. So they're looking at the UK bands. Yeah. There's only so many UK death metal bands that bring more than 60, 70 people to the table. And luckily, we're one of them where we can put on our CV. Well, we've toured with... X, Y, and Z. We've supported X, Y, and Z regionally. We've done Damnation. We've done Bloodstock. We're booked for these things. And they go, okay, well, there's obviously something to it, so let's give them a shot. And it's those early things like getting someone like yourself to take a punt on a, a bunch of wee guys from Glasgow who just really love making horrible noises. Yep. And getting that in front of people, and it's, it's a tick on the CV. And from there, it kind of... It, it gives the the roots to then really push out and to do more uh, more stuff. Well, I'm glad to hear it, and here we are using Damnation Versus podcast to plug them even further. So there you go. On that note, exactly. on that note, mate, it was an absolute pleasure. Thank you for all your time, and I will see you in fucking a dozen gigs in the next couple of months. Yes, it's been a pleasure, my man. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Speak to you soon, mate.